Hello, Kidney Warriors! Hey, James here from Dadvice TV, and this is another episode of Dadvice TV Live. It is Tuesday, February 6th, 7 p.m. Eastern here in the United States, and we are live. Hello, Kathleen. I see everyone else out here asking questions to post the comments. That's great. For those of you that are new, my name is James. I'm your kidney health coach. I am a kidney warrior. I have been living a great life with kidney disease coming up on five and a half years now. No dialysis here, but hey, if those of you out there have our own dialysis, you have questions, go ahead and ask those. My co-host has a lot of experience with diet and dialysis. She actually got started in dialysis and we'll let her tell her story real quick in a second. Um, tonight is a live Q and A with a real genuine renal dietitian. Let me tell you guys, for those that are new, Hey there, Mary. Nice to have you here with us. For those that are new, a renal dietitian, in my opinion, is the number one thing that you can do to help you better manage kidney disease. They are experts in what to eat and how to enjoy the foods you used to love that you thought, oh no, I can't eat those anymore. Chances are you work with a dietitian, they'll show you, hey, we can fit that into your diet. Maybe we got to eat a little bit less. Maybe we got to make a few little changes here, but they can make living on a kidney friendly diet, fun, enjoyable, and exciting. So if you're not working with a renal dietitian, definitely look into that. It is the one thing that made a huge difference in my entire trajectory. So let's go ahead and we're going to get into today's live Q and A. So if you have questions, Go ahead and type those in the comment. We're going to try to get to as many of them as we can over the next. We've got about 28 more minutes left in tonight's broadcast. So let's bring on my co-host from plantpoweredkidneys.com, an amazing Facebook group and website. And she's got all sorts of other great things to help you. Please welcome Jen Hernandez. Hey, Jen. Hi, James. Hi, everybody. I don't know if you caught me, James, while you were doing your introduction, but I took a quick picture to share on Instagram and Facebook, letting people know that, yes, this is actually live. So uh, if you're joining us from there, hi, welcome. Otherwise, if you're brand new and you don't know who I am, if I am brand new to your world, my name is Jen Hernandez. I am a registered dietitian and I specialize in helping kidney patients. So I'm the founder of Plant Powered Kidneys, which we started back in 2018. And we work with patients who have chronic kidney disease and want to protect their kidney health. There is something that every person in every stage and situation can do. I have never come across a person that had nothing that they could benefit from when it comes to the power of nutrition. And that's what we teach at Plant Powered Kidneys. So if you wanna learn more about what we do, how we help, you can get a ton of information on our website at plantpoweredkidneys.com. We have free meal plans. We have recipes, we have information articles, we have classes, we have tons of stuff for you to learn from registered renal dietitians. So I also want to get right into the Q&A. So um, let's get, let's dive in. We were already kind of looking at some of the questions, so I'm excited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And let me let everyone know there are links in the description to all of Jen's sites. So definitely when we're done with the video, visit those and go out there and Start finding lots and lots of great additional information. All righty. So let me scroll through the questions. If you see any, Jim, we got lots and lots of hellos. I love <laughs> out the there. familiar names. <laughs> oh, here's one that we, I, we mentioned earlier. Um, just as we are starting, Adriana said, how do I lower my protein if I'm not eating meat? And I'm not sure if she means protein in their urine. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to guess that's what they're probably meaning. Cause that would be the protein you'd want to reduce. Yeah. I'm, I'm also going to make that assumption. And Ariana, if you want to add more context to this, um, if, if it is specifically your urinary protein that you're talking about, just to confirm, that would be great. Or if there's something else specific, I'm happy to do my best to comment on that because this is a really common question that I get a lot. 
And we do have a lot of people in plant powered kidneys who follow us, who take our course, who work with our dietitians that are entirely plant based and protein in the urine is a big concern. One of the biggest things that I will always shout from the rooftops about this concept is that the protein in the urine doesn't always equate to the protein in your diet. It can have a factor in it if you're eating a ton of protein, but yeah, when you're not eating protein, if you're not eating the, the high protein sources like animal meats, what's going on there? Well, we do need to look back into what's going on with your kidney disease. And so this is a really important conversation to have with your nephrologist or your diagnosing provider, whoever is whoever you're speaking with about your chronic kidney disease, because the biggest question you need to ask is what what's causing my kidney disease? What is causing problems with my kidneys? Because the protein leaking is an indicator of damage to the kidneys. And so as long as there is this inflammation and damage, you can see higher protein in the urine as a result. So it's again, not always going to be related to the protein, unless again, you're having higher amounts of protein that are, it, it is leaking out from your, your kidney spilling this protein. So some of the reasons that we don't necessarily think of in this case, but can be really important to address are blood pressures and blood sugars, because diabetes and hypertension are the top two causes of kidney disease. So if your kidney disease is connected to either or both of these problems, it can be really important to pay attention to that. So in those cases, let's say high blood pressure is the problem causing damage with your kidneys. Then it's actually a matter of focusing thing on things like your sodium, looking at your potassium, making sure that you're getting good, healthy movement in to keep your blood pressure controlled, making sure you're following, um, you got me distracted here, James. <laughs> I love the movement. Stay active. That's yes, great for yes. all around. It is so, so important. And your body definitely responds in a positive way when you're doing movement that you enjoy because it does help lower blood pressure. So movement is fantastic. And again, following a lower sodium diet can be really, really helpful in this blood pressure control, which then cascades into helping control your kidney health and managing your kidney health because it's not creating additional pressure on the kidneys. So the same concept applies to taking care of your blood sugars. If you have diabetes, even pre-diabetes, that can be important to pay attention to. And I had a great conversation with a client about this last week, where it's, it's not necessarily about avoiding carbohydrates when we're talking about blood sugar control and diabetes management, but it's about making good quality carbohydrate choices, making sure that you're getting the fruits and veggies and whole grains as part of your diet, because the nutrients in there also support healthy blood sugar levels. So it's important to really choose good quality options as best as you can to help control your blood sugars, which again, down the road can help control your kidney health and reduce that protein that can be found in the urine. All right, here is a great question. From 208 Grumpy. Welcome 208 Grumpy. I think it's the first time I've seen you on one of our live calls. And we are almost at number 300 for these sessions that we've done across all the different live and other recorded videos. Grumpy asks, CKD3A, very good there, I like that. Potassium in the normal range, another great thing. Likes to have a glass of milk before bed. Can he continue to do that or is that something he should consider stopping? Well, something that I always like to put back when people are asking about, should I have this or should I not have it? Do you enjoy this? Is this something that you want to include or is this something that you feel like you have to do for a number of reasons? So kind of addressing those needs versus wants can be really helpful in general doing something like this would not be considered a harmful action on the kidneys. There's no one type of food. There's no, there's no one thing that we can pinpoint to say, oh, that's gonna damage your kidneys. There is an excessive amount of things like protein or excessive phosphorus, and in some cases, excessive potassium that can be damaging for kidney health. But looking at one item like that, not necessarily going to make or break the bank. 
one of the things that could be helpful is doing a uh, food log, doing a food diary that tracks your nutrition. So you do see, for example, how the potassium, how the phosphorus, how the protein in your milk routine, how that impacts your levels. Does it keep you within your goal ranges? Is it pushing you? Or did you already have the amount of nutrients that you should be having for the day? And then that glass of milk before bed is just kind of like adding extra nutrition load onto your kidneys, into your health. Chances are no, because I will tell you so often, um, I, I don't have clients come to me eating too much. I have clients coming to me not eating enough. And that's a very common conversation I have with my clients is how to get more nutrition in. So I would say in general, that's not going to be a problematic kind of thing. Um, but it is important to understand your own potassium goals uh, in, a, in phosphorus goals, protein goals. And in that earlier stage, there's great flexibility and variety. And it's often most important to just learn and better understand what these nutrients mean so that you can have deeper discussions with your healthcare team about it. And this is a lot of what we do in the plant powered kidneys course, which is our kind of like our go to program that we have for stage three patients to learn about potassium, phosphorus, sodium, protein, gut, all kinds of stuff. We really focus on all of that so that our students feel much more empowered in having really good conversations with their healthcare team and understanding how all of this nutrition comes together for them. So that was kind of like a side, but it just reminds me of this is, this is something that I, I do hear a lot of and we talk a lot about this kind of, these kind of questions in the course. Yeah, I was one of those people that when I was diagnosed, I over-restricted. Those that have been around for a long time have heard my story of trying to cook chili that was zero salt. I mean, zero salt mm -hmm. and how awful it tastes. It was unedible. And after taking the time to work with a dietitian, she asked me, what do you like to eat? What do you not like to eat? So she knew what things not to recommend. And all of a sudden... I'm eating everything I wanted to eat. Love avocados. I was scared to death them in the beginning. Boom. Just had some of my salad right before this. Delicious avocados. I make sure not to overdo it. And that's the great thing of working with a dietitian and understanding nutrition and how it plays a role in your choices. Now, speaking of dietitians, one of our uh, viewers out here says, how can I get a renal dietitian? How can I find one? And they're in New York City. Hmm. Um, so there are not a ton of us out there, but uh, I love, love, love connecting people with other renal dietitians, whether or not it can be somebody from Plant Powered Kidneys or if it can be somebody, a colleague that I know, because I do try my best to connect with other dietitians and help support them to get connected with more people. So there is a great renal dietitian. Um, I need, I don't remember his details off the top of my head. Um, uh, Steven Della Croce, D-E-L-L-A-C-R-O-C-E. -L -L -E. I think he's Italian. And so um, I'm probably butchering his name. I haven't talked to him in quite a while. He was one of the first dietitians that I connected with when I started Plant Powered Kidneys. And I was trying to get my business up and running. Um, but he's a renal dietitian and he is based in New York. So I think I'm not going to go into guessing where he's at right now. He's somewhere in the New York area, um, but he is an option. Um, I've worked with New York clients before as well. Um, I believe some of our plant powered kidney dietitians that I believe two of our dietitians, other dietitians have some open spots right now. So you can look and learn more about our dietitians and apply to work with one of us if you're interested in our approach and how we work with clients. Um, another way you can do it too is contacting your health insurance company. So the health insurance provider that you have often has a database of dietitians. And so you can call them. There is usually a, a customer support number on the back of your card. You can call and ask for a dietitian in your network who takes your insurance. I will warn you that you may or may not find renal specializing dietitians that are accepting insurance. Um, a lot of us are, for many reasons, have to be out of network or out of insurance. Um, 
but it is a way to look into more resources for you. And because you know plant powered kidneys, you can use us as a resource as well for the dietitian that you are working with. I just had a call today with a dietitian from a previous client who is get, getting into a new program for his health. And so I collaborated with that dietitian to help my past patient in, in continuing his care. So um, all of that to say, we are really hoping to help people find dietitians. It doesn't have to be us, it, you know, but find somebody that you wanna work with and either takes your insurance or somebody you trust, both, whatever you can find. I think it's really, really fantastic and, and very doable. Yeah, and I'll tell you, whether the dietitian's online or in person, working with one makes such a big difference. The nice thing is you don't have to be there in person. It's a lot of conversation, getting to know each other and learning from them. And the courses you do online are great for people who don't have a dietitian easily available to them. Yeah, First, we find, yep. oh, I was oh, just gonna add, we find that um, a lot of our students go through our course and we do our Q and A sessions. They have a lot of content, a lot of homework. I do give homework out. Uh, they do have assignments to do, but by the time they get to one-on-one -on -one with their dietitian, whatever the dietitian's level of renal experience is, the, our students feel so prepared in knowing what to talk about and they can really just speed past a lot of the basic information and they can really get into like a lot of the nitty gritty stuff right away because a lot of dietitians what they'll do to start is a lot of basic education to teach those foundations but that's where we use the course to help people take care of that ahead of time and then leverage their one-on-one -on -one sessions much, much better. So we found that to be really helpful. Here is a very common question that I get asked, especially at work by other coworkers. Someone's trying to become vegetarian. They want to cut down the amount of meat they eat. And they like to know your thoughts on beyond meat. Is it okay to eat? Yeah, well, we've had, <laughs> we've had this conversation before. Um, I think it's kind of like a stepping stone option, but the the bigger picture for me is we want to include more whole plants and Beyond Meat is quite a processed food item. It can have a lot of added salt, potentially <laughs> potassium and phosphate additives because they are making it a processed food. So there are things to consider when you do want to add something like this. So in general, I say every now and then, or if you know, a lot of restaurants will be using these kinds of items as a substitute for meat or for like the regular meat options. But when you compare them side by side, they're not necessarily that much better looking at the nutrition profile. Yes, the source of the protein changes and that can be great. But very often I see that the plant option is significantly higher in sodium or it has those phosphate additives or something where it's like, eh, I mean, this is kind of like whack-a-mole, I think, where it's like, sure, you, you know, knock down this animal meat protein, but then you have sodium, phosphorus, potassium, you have other moles popping up in the game. And so is that going to be a fair trade-off? If you do want to try something like a Beyond Meat product, I definitely would encourage you to look at the nutrition information, look at the nutrition facts, look at the ingredient list, and then also be thinking about how you can add more plants to whatever you're having. So stacking on, if you're doing like a burger, stacking on extra lettuce and tomatoes and onions and mushrooms and whatever kind of veggies you want. And then also having like a side bean salad or something with those other plant proteins and the fiber, which the Beyond Meat, I don't think it has fiber unless I checked. No, <laughs> so, it does not. It, but they make up for it in sodium. Yeah, it's yeah. So, crazy. I mean, I, I, I do think they're aware and they are continuing to make changes. And that's great because I think it's nice to have that, you know, alternative. But if they're going to put this idea of, oh, it's such a better plant based option, like let's really focus on it being a healthier option then and make sure that it's low in sodium and something that we can eat. Because again, 20 grams of protein here versus 20 grams of protein here, there is some difference with the digestibility scores, but it's still, I'm not, I'm not going to say, yeah, sure. All the time, every day, every meal. Yeah. The, their, their blood pressure would go crazy. The, the yeah. sodium level is the one thing that keeps me from all of these artificial meats. It's very difficult to find, you know, some of the chickens 
aren't bad. They're not good, mm -hmm. but they're not bad on the sodium to where it's like half a day in one little patty. And then that's without a bun or anything. All right. Yeah. Michelle would like to know your thoughts on juice. Um, I mean, so what, what are we thinking of here? Because there's a lot of, there's a lot of different ways that we could approach this. Um, and a lot of different ways that people also think of juice, like green juices versus the idea of juicing versus just having it in the diet. So I'll try to touch on some of these kind of different ideas, uh, different concepts. So in general, including it in the diet can absolutely be okay. So if it's something that you enjoy, just know that a serving, which is like a fruit serving, one serving of fruit for juice is four ounces, which I have this cup. I think this is a two ounce cup here. So, you know, two of these, it's it's a small portion when it comes to juice. And, and normally you're not going to get a four ounce glass. If you did get a four ounce glass at a restaurant, you'd probably feel like, it's highway robbery and, and you're feel cheated <laughs> yes yes but understand that four ounces is considered a serving the other thing is that juice is not going to have the fiber in it and so it is considered a simple carbohydrate it's considered considered a simple sugar because it is just that sugar from the uh, from the fruit so if you're going to have it try to include it as part of your meal where you are including fiber, healthy fats, some protein in that to help with that sugar, slowing down that digestion and absorption of it. If we are going to look at it from like green juices, that can be fine too. But again, I, I don't like looking at green juices as a replacement for the actual produce because you're only using a part of the plant. And if you ever watch people like some of the stores or the, the juice shops or whatever, if you ever watch them make juices, you might see how much of the actual fruit or vegetable they don't use. They're only putting a part of it and they're getting rid of a lot of it. And you're not going to get those nutrients if you're not using that. So instead of or maybe using juices maybe try making something like a smoothie like a fruit smoothie where you can add some more to it you can keep the whole fruit you can add more bulk and volume to it you can add more filling items like you can you add oats to your smoothie which i love i think it makes such a fun taste and it's kind of like a a fruit pie uh, like a flavor. Um, so you can add oats, you can add chia seeds or hemp seeds. You can make it much more satisfying and filling for you that you can get more out of it. So at the end of the day, yes, it's probably something that you can include, but is it the best option? Is it something that you do want to have that's going to pack a lot of potassium, for example, in that small amount compared to having like a whole piece of fruit? Okay, we've had a couple people asked this question that Teresa also asked, what do you think of intermittent fasting for those with CKD? Uh, this has come up more recently lately, and there is some research in some situations about fasting potentially. Like I want to like put so much caveats in here to say like, maybe possibly in some cases there can be benefit in the general population there's not enough research that i've come across to say that it is in fact helpful so we do need to look at the individual in these cases in many situations i have had clients ask me about it and we talk about something that is maybe realistic for them don't forget we're all theoretically already fasting because when you have dinner and you, you're done eating for the night and you go to bed and then you wake up in the morning and then you have breakfast that is a fast my friend you have gone a solid eight to ten hours without eating yes you were sleeping so you weren't going to be eating but it's still a fast anyway and that's why we have break fast we have breakfast in the morning to give our body that nourishing food and nutrition so talk with your healthcare team about fasting if it's something that you feel could be helpful for you if you have diabetes it's incredibly important to talk with your team about it because those high and low blood sugars can make a really big difference and it might not be appropriate for your situation because of that blood sugar control because fasting does not help blood sugars so definitely talk with your team about it i in general 
don't typically advise it. Uh, there is some research for potentially for polycystic kidney disease, for PKD specifically, that it may be helpful with PKD in preventing the cyst growth. So PKD is when there's a lot of cysts on the kidneys that grow and grow and grow. And there is some potential research, I believe it's animal studies though. Um, there is potential research that intermittent fasting could help in those specific cases. So Code Judy ask your thoughts on meal replacement protein drinks. I'll tell you, those are so tempting. A bottle with everything I need in it. Oh, mm -hmm. it sounds like a great thing. What are your thoughts? I, I understand the convenience of it and also the idea that we don't have to think about putting something together for a meal or if we're really busy and on the go and we think, oh, I can just drink this and be done. But a lot of these meal replacement protein shakes or just protein shakes in general, they're not the right nutrient balance for kidney patients as they are for other people. The normal person who can have a higher protein diet, sure, that could be a good option. However, some of these protein drinks are 20 to 30 grams, like the ready to go ones. I've seen usually 20 to 30 grams is pretty standard. That could be potentially a half a day, and in some cases, a full day's amount of protein for somebody with kidney disease. So it's incredibly important to understand that doing a protein supplement like that, whether it's powdered, ready to go, any type of like protein shake like that, probably isn't going to be the best bet for you, especially if you do have to be careful with your protein. And this is usually stages four and stages five in kidney disease, not on dialysis. Now, dialysis patients, if you are joining us from the dialysis chair or after a treatment or before a treatment on your day off, protein shakes can be a great option because the dialysis is removing some of the protein from the body. And so there is a higher need for protein for dialysis patients because that dialysis machine is doing a lot of work. So dialysis patients, protein supplements could be a great option not necessarily for everybody doesn't have to be the case so talk with your dialysis dietitian to make sure it's appropriate for you as well before you get started on anything um, but as you can see there's just such a big variety with this idea of a renal diet and something just like a protein shake we can't we can't just say flat out yes because there's a lot of different cases and a lot of different situations all right here is a kind of a complicated question but we'll get your mm -hmm. opinion on it so Michelle has concerns about bottled water, but it's not, hey, which type of bottled water? Plastic versus glass. She has heard a lot of news about the plastic leaching into the water, and so have I. As a matter of fact, I will never buy um, plastic bottled water from like a gas station because a lot of times it sits outside and the sun's just beating down on it and heating it up. Um, I have concerns with that. Um, but what are your thoughts for someone who enjoys drinking bottled water? Do you have any concerns of plastic versus bottle, the you know, glass bottle? It's, I'll be honest, it is not top of mind for me because I have not looked into enough of the research. And there is a lot of information, especially on social media, you know, here in, in, in this different in this area that we are broadcasting compared to some of the other social media platforms. There's a lot of people that can just say anything, anything they want and maybe don't have the research to back it. And so just really anything you take in from social media, even us, like I, I will say, you can, you know, put us through the ring or two because it's important to understand the information that you're coming across and making sure that it's not for one, it's not somebody just kind of talking about this like fear mongering idea of like, are they selling something specifically? Are they saying like, don't do this bottle of water, buy my bottle instead? Like, that's clearly marketing, right? Yeah. And so you want to pay attention for things like that. But then there's also things that are more subtle too. There are influencers out there who will talk about, you know, don't, don't buy this, buy this product. And they don't always mention that they actually have a financial investment. Mm, yeah. And they are the owner, they are a investor themselves. And so they get profits from this company. It, it can be really, really hidden and it can be really, really shady. So 
you know, people should be disclosing their relationship, their, their financial relationships with anything, but they don't always do that. Um, so that's unfortunate. That's just kind of a side note to say, you know, be careful with any information you come across. Um, I will say personally for the plastic versus glass, I mean, I will look at getting a reusable bottle. I, I don't have it in my office with me right now. Yeah, I have a big, like a gallon one. That I've, I've had this now. So my daughter, I gave in. She wanted a Stanley. Ugh. $45 yeah, that's for how it a starts. Cup. That's how it starts. You give them one. <laughs> I've had this since I was diagnosed with kidney disease and I gave up soda. 52 ounces. Got this at Walmart. Mm -hmm. I do not have any stake in the company. I hope it's still around. Camelback. I love yeah. it because it's a wide opening, easy to clean, holds a lot of water. I drink about three of these a day with my lemon or cherry or stuff in there. This is all lemon right now. So it's lemon water, nice and delicious yeah. and refreshing. Works yeah. great. I think something like that is totally, you is, is great to have. I have my like smaller, this is my smaller 24 ounce reusable cup that I use. And yeah, it's plastic, but I wash it. I don't leave it outside for crazy amount of time. Um, but again, I, I would look for something reusable when my husband and I are traveling and we are on the road, I will actually buy like the gallons of water or the big, um, like the big, they're not travel friendly, but, um, I think it's like two or three gallons worth of water. We'll get those and we'll take those with us and then use that to refill our reusable bottle. Because also I'm, being trying to be more conscious about the environment and using less plastic and making yeah. sure that we are not having that impact. So in that case, I, that's kind of more what I think of in that regard, when it comes to like plastics and microplastics and things, let's, let's put that at the, the lower priority. Cause there's other things I'm thinking that we can address with nutrition, with our health before we get into that. <laughs> Very good. Now we are, we are out of time, but I want to get one last question in, and it's one that we've already answered. But Valsa, and I'm hoping I'm saying her name correctly, asked, could you please repeat the name of that New York dietitian? She thinks you said Stephen Delarose. Yeah, I, okay, so I can spell it. I just don't know if I can say it right. So it's S-T-E-P-H-E-N, and then his first last name d e l l a and then c r o c e there we go and i'm gonna put it on the screen i'm right gonna hard to me sent you <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, <laughs> hey, i saw jen on the internet she sent me to you <laughs> and I'm like, where are these people <laughs> all right all right thank you so much jen it's been great having you and everyone else thank you if you found this helpful please give it a thumbs up you know, put some comments. Let us know what you liked about it. What would you like for us to talk about next month? We'll be right back here first Tuesday of next month to do another live Q&A. It's, you know, 30 minutes of getting full access right here to a real renal dietitian. Knows what she's talking about. Make sure you hit up her Facebook page, plantpoweredkidneys.com, as well as the website. The uh, links are down below in the description. And I will have another show soon this month with Dr. Rosansky. Um, he's traveling. Him and his wife love to travel. I'm so jealous for that, getting to, to go around everywhere and have a great time. I'm looking forward to having him back on here. We're going to have more shows throughout the year. Um, so thank you guys. And I will see you all in the next video. Bye, everyone.